In these podcasts, we uncover one chapter after another from the life of the Prophet ﷺ in an attempt to learn about him, love him, and better ourselves through his example. Immersion, mentorship, companionship, and tarbiyah. These are just a few of the things we offer alongside knowledge of the prophetic biography at Sirah Intensive. Two weeks dedicated to the study of the life of the Prophet ﷺ and his noble characteristics. So this winter, join me in Dallas, Texas, alongside your classmates from all over the world to learn the story of the life of the best of humanity, the mercy to mankind, the Prophet Muhammad ﷺ. Go to sirahintensive.com to register and for more information. So, Bismillah, Alhamdulillah, wa salatu wa salamu ala Rasulillah wa ala alihi wa sahbihi ajma'in. So, inshallah, continuing with our study of the life of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, Asiratu Nabawiyah, the prophetic biography. So, as I was saying, we'll be starting with the study of the fifth year of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam's residence in the city of Medina, the fifth year of Hijrah. Now, in the previous session, we concluded by talking about the end of the fourth year of Hijrah and kind of an overview of some of the major events uh, of that fourth year of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam's residence there. So, in the beginning of the fifth year, one of the first things I'll mention here from the very get-go is that the fifth year of Hijrah is notable for the particular reason that the Prophet ﷺ only traveled once during this year. Now, if you know you recall from our study of the first four years, and it's definitely something I recommend that you go back and read or listen to the previous podcasts as well, that the Prophet ﷺ, particularly during the second, third, and fourth year, the Prophet ﷺ traveled outside of Medina quite a few times. But in the fifth year, it's a notable fact, Ibn Ishaq um, and uh, Waqidi and many, many others, Ibn Kathir, they all mentioned the fact that, فَأَقَامَ بِالْمَدِينَةِ بَقِيَةَ سَنَتِهِ That the Prophet ﷺ remained in the city of Medina for the majority of the fifth year of Hijrah. There's only one journey the Prophet ﷺ took in this particular year, and that was known as the campaign of Dumatul Jandal. Ghazwatu Dumatul Jandal. Now, Dumatul Jandal is the name of a particular place. This is a place that is north of the city of Medina, uh, on the way to Bilad Sham. Basically, if you look at a modern day map of that region, so it is north of Medina, um, you know, and from that particular point, you can either go northwest, and you would enter into the region that we know as modern day Jordan, or you could continue to proceed north or go a little northeast and you would proceed into Iraq. So the Prophet ﷺ traveled out in the direction of Dumatul Jandal. Now the Prophet ﷺ traveled to Dumatul Jandal in the month of Rabi'ul Awwal. So that means that the first few months of this new year, the fifth year, the Prophet ﷺ for the first couple of months remained in the city of Medina. After that, he traveled to this place called Dumatul Jandal. Now, why did the Prophet ﷺ travel? Especially considering the fact that, you know, this is very close to the region of Asham, Bilad Sham, that region. So why did the Prophet ﷺ uh, travel there? So the historians, uh, Waqidi mentions actually that Jama'atun min as-salaf, that many of the scholars of the past have noted the fact that ذُكِرَ لَهُ أَنَّ بِدُومَةِ الْجَنْدَلِ جَمْعًا كَثِيرًا That the Prophet ﷺ was told that there was a huge group of people out at the place of Dumatul Jandal. And the interesting thing about this group of people were was that it was almost like a town or a, a colony or maybe if you uh, a marketplace, kind of like a gathering space of like criminals and bandits. وَأَنَّهُمْ يَظْلِمُونَ مَنْ مَرَّ بِهِمْ that they used to rob and loot and murder people as they would pass by there. So they, it, was, it was considered a very problematic area and something that started to become a real threat in the region. Along with that, they had a huge marketplace out there, but there was also a large contingency, like I said before, of like these bandits and crooks and criminals and thieves. And they had set their eyes on the city of Medina. وَهُمْ يُرِيدُونَ أَنْ يَدْنُوا مِنَ الْمَدِينَةِ They had thought about picking up 
because they were kind of like a makeshift uh, marketplace. Um, so they had actually considered and started to look into the possibilities of picking up their operation and coming closer to the city of Medina. Now, why is that so problematic? Because obviously, they were notorious for criminal activity. And, and for robbing and looting and murdering people. And they were basically, they realized that the city of Medina is growing. People are flocking to it from far and wide. This would make an ideal target for us. And we could end up conducting a lot of quote-unquote business over there. Their type of business. So the Prophet ﷺ to um, let them know that the, that the city of Medina was something that they, they would protect and that they would not allow these people to bring all their criminal activity and their gang activity to the city of Medina or near the city of Medina and thereby threaten Islam and Muslims and the, and the peace in the city of Medina, the Prophet ﷺ gathered a thousand Muslims. A thousand Muslims, a very large group. <clears throat> and the Prophet ﷺ traveled out in that direction. He proceeded in that direction. And it said that this was at the time of the year during the summer season, so it was very hot. So what the Sahaba were doing during this time, this was very odd and kind of out of the ordinary, but they were doing it due to need and necessity. They would travel at night and then they would stop during the daytime. Because it was just too difficult and too fatiguing and dehydrating to travel during the daytime as well. So it is not easy to travel at the nighttime because again, we just take a lot of things for granted. You don't have roads, you don't have lights, you don't have any of these things. So a lot of the time, unless you're in the middle of the month where you have the full moon and that is providing some type of light at nighttime, right? Some type of brightness at nighttime, you a lot of times might just end up traveling like in pitch dark. And it's not very easy. But they had a, um, they had a guide. The Prophet ﷺ had acquired, had hired a guide to lead them who knew this region and this area very, very well. And he was from the tribe of Banu Uzra, and his name was Madhkur. They called him Madhkur. So he was a very, very expert guide who knew this entire uh, path like the back of his hand. The, the narration mentions, Hadin Khidritun. He was like an expert guide who could do this with his eyes closed because that's quite literally what it was like traveling at nighttime. So the narration says that when they got close to Dumatul Jandal, this place, the, the guide, Madhkur, he saw that there were some uh, animals that were grazing that belonged to Bani Tamim. And so the Prophet ﷺ proceeded in that particular direction, and they ended up meeting some of those people, and they basically ran and scattered from there. They realized, okay, the Muslims have come, because they were planning to come towards Medina. They realized the Muslims have come, and they saw this huge army of a thousand. So then they ran away. And they all dispersed from there. The Prophet ﷺ came to the area of Dumatul Jandal, فَلَمْ يَجِدْ بِهَا أَحَدٌ أَحَدًا The Prophet ﷺ did not find anyone there. فَأَقَامَ أَيَّامًا The Prophet ﷺ stayed there for a few days. وَبَثَّ saraya. He sent scouts in all different directions. Now what's going on here? And they kept coming back, the scouts kept coming back to the Prophet ﷺ saying, we're not finding anything in this region. Until Muhammad bin Maslama, radiallahu ta'ala anhu, who we've talked about a number of times, a very devout and trustworthy companion of the Prophet ﷺ, he could always depend on Muhammad bin Maslama. He found one man and he brought him back with him. And the Prophet ﷺ asked him, where did the whole group, kind of like the gang, that was settled over here, where did they all go? And he said, Harabu Ams. They found out that you had come close and so they ran away from here. Because they were nefarious people, they had bad intentions, so they ran away. The Prophet ﷺ said, okay, but while we're here, we might as well, you know, fulfill the task, the primary task for which we travel, for which we have come. فَعَرَضَ عَلَيْهِ رَسُولُ اللَّهِ صلى الله عليه وسلم الإسلام. This one man from the gang that was found, the Prophet ﷺ sat him down and spoke to him about Islam. And invited him to believe in Allah. فَأَسْلَمَ The man became Muslim. وَرَجَعَ رَسُولَ اللَّهِ صلى الله عليه وسلم And the Prophet ﷺ returned back to the city of Medina. And <clears throat> so 
the notable thing about this particular campaign and expedition is that this lasted for about a month. Because even when you look at the map, it is quite a bit of a distance. And then the Prophet ﷺ stayed there for a number of days, scouting the entire region and area, making sure that the danger to the city of Medina had been uh, handled, had been mitigated, and then the Prophet ﷺ returned. So there was no fighting on this particular journey. This one individual from that gang who was left over ended up accepting Islam. And then the Prophet ﷺ returned back. And it's mentioned that um, one of the people who was on this particular campaign with the Prophet ﷺ was one of the leaders of the Ansar. His name is Sa'ad bin Ubada. Sa'ad ibn Ubada radiallahu ta'ala anhu. And he was one of the leaders of the people of the Ansar. His mother, Umm Sa'ad, passed away while the Prophet ﷺ was on this particular journey. And when the Prophet ﷺ came back, he actually went and prayed for her. He like prayed her janazah at her grave. And this was as a sign of respect and kindness uh, and generosity towards one of the leaders of the community of the Prophet Wasallam, And so a lot of times there are these little things that are mentioned on the periphery of some of these narrations. But one of the tragedies of our time is that we study not even a seerah, we study a summary of the summary of the seerah. And so a lot of times we don't benefit from, you know, the, the, the character and the strategy and the methodology of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And so it's very important that we take these little details and really understand what that tells us. This goes to show us that Sa'ad bin Ubada was somebody the Prophet sallallahu could trust. He was somebody that when Islam first came to the city of Medina, before even the Prophet ﷺ himself was able to come to the city of Medina, Sa'ad bin Ubadah was somebody the Prophet ﷺ appointed as a leader in the city, and he could trust him, and he, uh, uh, he, he was able to benefit from Sa'ad bin Ubadah really leading the community and organizing the community, awaiting the arrival of the Prophet ﷺ. And he was somebody the Prophet ﷺ continued to be able to rely upon for leadership amongst his people. So we see the Prophet ﷺ cared for everyone. But we see that the Prophet ﷺ understood that there is a certain dynamic. And this is something that is very, very tragic in our communities today. That when there are people... When there are people who are working with you, who are serving you, who are serving your cause, and sacrificing their own time and dedicating their own talents and abilities to be able to help you further the cause, then it is also very important that we value these people. And that we give special time and special attention to such individuals. Right, Because the thing that I mentioned that is so tragic in our communities nowadays is that a lot of times what ends up happening is the people that are closest to us or the people that are already serving and working, we tend to take them for granted. They're already in the loop, they're already our own people, we see them regularly and we start to kind of take them for granted. But it's very, very important because we live in this type of consumer world where we have a consumer or a capitalistic mentality and we're always looking for new customers and new clients and new customers and new clients, right? So we're always concerned about expansion and outreach and how to reach further out, right? In terms of the people that maybe are uh, invested or are partaking within a particular service or a cause that we're involved with, community work. The vo but at the same time, what we have to understand is while we continue to grow and expand, and that most definitely is a good idea, we also need to continue to be loyal and to deepen the relationship, the bond, the trust, and the benefit that the people closest to us receive. That the people closest to us, you know, they need to be able to receive that benefit. Right? And so it's very, very important that we understand that, that, we, that we serve the people that are serving us or serving along with us. And we show them the type of loyalty they've been showing to us. And that was a very profound quality of the Messenger Wasallam. So even though he comes back from a month-long journey, and Sa'ad bin Ubadah is heartbroken when he arrives home to find his mother has passed, the Prophet ﷺ, before worrying about himself and his own fatigue and coming back from a journey and everything else that he needs to do, he first realizes one of my core people, core team members, one of my volunteers has a tragedy and he's suffering and he's struggling. And so the Prophet ﷺ specially goes and gives attention. And I mean, just imagine what a great honor that must have been for Sa'ad bin Ubadah. And how honored and validated and you know, dignified 
and respected and loved he must have felt that the Prophet ﷺ would come to the grave of my mother and make dua for her forgiveness at her grave. The Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Right, so this is a very profound lesson and it's something that we really should give a lot of thought to as we continue to build community and do the work that we do. Let's remember to not forget the people who serve with us in the trenches. And remember to give more time and more special attention to them. And that's the quality of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. The next major event, so as I mentioned that Ibn Ishaq and Waqidi and Ibn Kathir and Ibn Hisham and many of the scholars mentioned, فَأَقَامَ بِالْمَدِينَةَ فِي الْمَدِينَةِ بَقِيَةَ سَنَتِهِ That the Prophet ﷺ remained in Medina for the, was in Medina, he did not travel for the remainder of the year. Later on in the fifth year of Hijrah, quite a bit later on, in the month of Shawwal, so this is post Ramadan, is one of the most major events of the life of the Prophet ﷺ and the Medinan period, and that is Ghazwatul Ahzab. Ghazwatul Ahzab. Al Ahzab means the allies, the allies, or the allied army. All right, the army that was comprised of different groups, the allies. It is also referred to as Ghazwatul Khandaq. Al Khandaq means a trench. Right? Kind of a trench as a defense strategy to keep the enemy away from you. So this is referred to both as Ghazwatul Ahzab and Ghazwatul Khandaq. Alright? Now, of course, some folks might be familiar that there is a surah in the Qur'an in the order of the Mus'haf, the, the Qur'an as we have it today. It is surah number 33. It is called Suratul Ahzab. Suratul Ahzab. The surah about the Allied army or the army of the allies. The, the beginning part of this surah, I would say um, close to about you know, 20, 26 ayat, the first 26 ayat of this surah, which is quite a lengthy passage, was revealed about this particular incident. So as we've done in previous instances where there is a large portion of the Qur'an that is revealed in regards to a particular incident, Surah Al-Anfal about the Ghazwat Al-Badr, the Battle of Badr, Surah Al-Anfal was revealed about that. Uh, we similarly took a look at a large section of Surah Ali Imran about uh, Ghazwat Uhud, the Battle of Uhud. You had a large section of Surah Ali Imran that was revealed. We also talked about Banu Nadir and Surah Al-Hashar. All right, surah number fifty-nine. So similarly, the uh, the front, the, the the beginning portion of Surah Al-Ahzab was revealed about this particular incident, the Battle of the Trench, Ghazwat Al-Khandaq. But as as I was mentioning, what we've done in all those other instances, what I find to be beneficial, so that we can really appreciate the depth of the Quran and the precision of the Book of Allah Subhanahu Wa Taala, and also develop kind of a visual where we can kind of see what the Qur'an is talking about. We can, we can close our eyes and really t- you know, go through the ayat and take that journey that the ayat are taking us through. We will talk about, we will explore the, uh, the, the, the battle of the trench, Ghazwat al-Khandaq. And at the conclusion of our discussion about the battle of the trench, we will then go to the surah and we will read through the first 26 ayat of the surah and then we'll be able to really profoundly benefit and understand insha'Allah what the ayat are exactly talking about. So as I was mentioning now, um, I'm not going to spend too much time on this because it's technical discussion and there's a lot of technical jargon in this, con- in this discussion. But there is some discussion amongst the historians, the scholars of Sirah, the scholars of Hadith, and the scholars of Islamic history about when did the Battle of the Trench precisely happen. Now I already told you it happened in the month of Shawwal in the fifth year of Hijrah, the fifth year of the Prophet ﷺ's residence in the city of Medina. While that is the opinion of the vast overwhelming majority, and that is pretty much the conclusion that is arrived at, that that is when it happened, there is some discussion and some detail about how that conclusion is arrived at. I'll share that very, very briefly with you. So, <clears throat> there are some narrations, Musa bin Uqba, um, and um, he narrates from Imam Zuhri. Imam al-Zuhri, all right, who is one of the major scholars of the city of Medina and a historian of Islam. 
And similarly, Imam Malik bin Anas has narrated this. Imam Malik, uh, Imam Ahmad has also brought this narration. They've also mentioned this narration. That Imam Zuhri says, ثُمَّ كَانَتْ وَقْعَةُ الْأَحْزَابِ فِي شَوَال سَنَةَ أَرْبَعَ That he says that the, the battle of the trench occurred in the month of Shawal in the fourth year. Not the fifth year, in the fourth year. So now you have a difference of opinion. Did it happen in the fourth year or fifth year? And it's a major difference of opinion. Because you're talking about a difference of a whole entire year. Right? So, Imam al-Bayhaqi and others explain that in reality, there is no difference of opinion. It is just the way that they express dates. So some of the scholars, what they would count is, they would say, when they would say Shawwal, they say the month of Shawwal, بعد السنة الأربعة after بعد السنة الرابعة after the fourth year of Hijrah the month of Shawwal after the fourth year which is what some call شهر uh, Shawwal في السنة الخامسة it's بعد versus في بعد means after في means in so those who said it's in the fifth year they said في in the fifth year those who mentioned the fourth year they are actually saying it is in the Shawwal that came after the fourth year so in reality, there's no difference. But if you look at it from the surface, you see the word five, you see the word four, and you see an apparent contradiction. But in reality, there is no difference because of how they express dates. Some express it by saying shawal after fourth, after four, and some say shawal in five. All right, so that's a simple difference of opinion. Similarly, um, some have also uh, mentioned that there's a small minority uh, of scholars, Imam al-Bayhaqi and others, they mentioned this, that there, are, there is a very, very small group of uh, people, scholars, who counted the first year of Hijrah. The Prophet ﷺ arrived in the city of Medina in the month of Rabi'ul Awwal. Muharram Safar, Rabi'ul Awwal. He arrived in the month of Medina in the third month. So they started counting the first year of Hijrah from the following year. It's almost like they considered the, those nine months of the Prophet ﷺ initial residence in the city of Medina, they almost counted that as like year zero. And then they started keeping count from year one the following year. right? And that leads to sometimes kind of a discrepancy in terms of how they count. So those people... Those, those few, very minority, small minority of scholars, they would say that Badr happened in the first year, Uhud happened in the second year, right? And Khandaq happened in the fourth year. But Umar ibn Khattab radiallahu ta'ala anhu, who really standardized the Islamic calendar, and instituted a system of keeping track of the Islamic calendar, and the vast overwhelming majority of the scholars, when the Prophet ﷺ arrived in the month of Rabiul Awal, they counted that as year one. So the majority, and that is the norm, that is what we operate by, they say that Badr happened in the second year. And Uhud happened in the third year. And Khandaq happened in the fifth year. And not only that, but Abdullah bin Umar, radiallahu ta'ala anhuma, or excuse me, um, uh, Imam al-Zuhri, Imam al-Zuhri, he very clearly mentions in more than one place, that بِأَنَّ الْخَنْدَقْ كَانَتْ بَعْدَ Uhud بِسَنَتَيْنِ that the battle of the trench happened two years after the battle of Uhud. And the battle of Uhud was in the month of Shawwal in the third year. So this obviously happened in the month of Shawwal in the fifth year. Alright, so that is very clearly elaborated upon. There's a couple of other things that raise just a couple of questions. One of them that we should, we should deal with because it is a hadith in the Sahihain. It is a hadith in Bukhari and Muslim, which holds a lot of weight from our perspective. And that is the hadith of Abdullah bin Umar, radiallahu ta'ala anhuma. He says that, عُرِدْتُ عَلَى رَسُولَ اللَّهِ صَلَى اللَّهِ عَلَى يَوْمَ أُحُدْ وَنَا إِبْنُ أَرْبَعَةَ عَشَرَ سَنَةً That I was presented to the Prophet صلى الله عليه وسلم on the day of Uhud, and I was 14 years old. فَلَمْ يَجُزْنِي يُجِزْنِي The Prophet صلى الله عليه وسلم did not give me permission to go and fight. وَعُرِدْتُ عَلَيْهِ يَوْمَ الْخَنْدَقِ وَأَنَا إِبْنُ خَمْسَ عَشَرَ And I was presented to the Prophet ﷺ on the day of Khandaq, and I was 15 years old, فَأَجَازَنِي And he gave me permission to fight. That again presents the same problem. 
Because Imam Zuhri, we just said, said, Khandaq happened two years later, third and fifth year. Where he's saying, I was 14 years old one year, 15 years old, 14 years old at the time of Uhud, 15 years old at the time of Khandaq. But again, the scholars have explained this, that this is not something very problematic, number one, because a lot of times they did not keep very specific track of the exact day of the birthday. They would just overall kind of generally refer to about 14 years of age, about 15 years of age. That's one thing, and that's a historical fact. So it really doesn't cause any confusion. The second thing is that it's also the way Imam al-Bayhaqi and others have also said that when he was presented to the Prophet ﷺ on the day of Uhud, he was either just about to turn 14 or he had just turned 14. And thereby, even if he was just about to turn 14, he's rounding up and basically saying, I was 14 years old. Trying to get himself approved for the battle. And when he's saying that I was 15 on the day of, he was towards the end of, you know, being 15 and very close to turning 16. So either way, it once again does not really cause any type of a conflict. But nevertheless, I just wanted to share this particular fact because it is mentioned by prominent scholars like Imam Malik, Imam Ahmad, and also the Hadith in Bukhari and Muslim. So we've established the fact that the Battle of Khandaq, the Battle of the Trench happened in the fifth year of Hijrah in the month of Shawwal, post-Ramadan. Now what exactly transpired? Why did the Battle of the Trench happen? So very briefly... I'll share some of the narrations here that there was a group of Jewish leaders. There was a group of some of the Jewish leaders. Amongst them was Salam ibn Abil Huqiq al Nadari, Banu Nadir, one of the leaders of Banu Nadir who had been um, exiled from Medina due to their treachery and treason against the constitution of Medina, which we talked about previously. Number two was Huyay bin Akhtab al Nadari, another leader, Huyay bin Akhtab, who was actually the one who conspired to assassinate the Prophet ﷺ from amongst Banu Nadi. So he also was a part of this because some of these leaders, when they fled, when they left uh, the area of Medina, they went and took refuge in the place of Khaybar. So they were there now, not too far away from Medina. So they were a part of this group. Along with that, you had Kinana ibn Rabia ibn Abil Huqayq, Hawza bin Qais al-Wa'ili, Abu Ammar al-Wa'ili. And so there were some leaders from Banu Nadir and some leaders from Banu Wa'il. Some of the Jews that were at the place of Khaybar. So they all got together. وَهُمُ الَّذِينَ حَزَّبُوا الْأَحْزَابَ عَلَىٰ رَسُولَ اللَّهِ صَلَىٰهِ 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 صَلَ
taking a look at these people who were given the book. They at least have some portion of the original book Allah revealed, not all of it. Right? But they have some portion of the original book that Allah had revealed. يُؤْمِنُونَ بِالْجِبْتِ وَالطَّاغُوتِ In spite of the fact that they have some of the sacred text or sacred book, they believe in falsehood. They believe in idols. They, they claim that idols are correct. وَيَقُولُونَ لِلَّذِينَ كَفَرُوا And they say to people who have no iman whatsoever, they have no shades of the truth at all, هَؤُلَاءِ أَهْدَى مِنَ الَّذِينَ آمَنُوا سَبِيلًا and they would dare testify and they say that you people who worship idols are much more rightly guided than the people who have iman, the people who believe in the Qur'an. أُولَٰئِكَ الَّذِينَ لَعَنَهُمُ اللَّهِ And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said, these people, the curse of Allah is upon them. How could they say such a thing? وَمَنْ يَلَعَنِ اللَّهُ فَلَن تَجِدَ لَهُ نَصِيرًا And people who the curse of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is upon, they will never find, you will never find anyone there to help them. So after this little exchange, and they basically went out of their way and stated all types of lies and falsehood to try to gain the favor of the Quraysh in waging war against the Prophet ﷺ, the Quraysh finally agreed. And they said, okay, we will go to war with you. And we will gather together. Not only that, but also this same Jewish delegation then went to Ghatfan. They went to the tribes of Ghatfan. And they recruited them as well. And they told them that the Quraysh are joining us as well. So because the Quraysh was joining, the tribes of Ghatfan agreed to join the war as well. So that's what forms the armies of the, uh, the army of the allies, Al-Ahzab. You had the Jews of Banu Nadir, you had the Jews of Khaybar, Banu Wa'il, you had the Jews, uh, excuse me, the, the Quraysh from Mecca, and the Mushrikun from the Quraysh in Mecca, and you also had the, the Arabs of Ghatfan. So this all came together. Quraysh was of course led by Abu Sufyan. The tribes of Ghatfan were led by Uyayna bin Hisan, one of their leaders, and uh, Al-Harith uh, bin Auf, and a few others. And then of course the Jewish tribes, they came together as well. And now they all started to gather together, form their army together, and march in the direction of Medina. Now when the Prophet ﷺ, heard that they are proceeding towards Medina with a force, you know, that is 10,000 10, strong. Like a huge force of people is arriving. The Prophet ﷺ, he consulted with the Sahaba about what should we do? How should we handle this? Because right now as it stands, we do not have, we can gather a thousand, maybe 1500 people together, but we do not have the numbers to be able to go out into the battlefield and meet them in open battle. It's just not a good strategy on our part, right? And this also shows you that strategy is very important, right? And creativity and strategy and consultation and the importance of it. Now, I'm going to take a little bit of a... Uh, a tangent if you will I'm going to go off to the side for a second And I'm going to remind all of us Of the story of Salman al-Farisi Radiallahu ta'ala anhu Which we talked about early in the podcast If you go all the way back You'll find a podcast specifically On the acceptance of Islam by Salman al-Farisi And we talked about this even prior to Revelation And the reason that we talked about it All the way back there Is that that is where the scholars Have also pl- uh, uh, mostly Usually placed that particular discussion And the reason for it is Salman al-Farisi was a beneficiary of a lot of the prophecies about the Prophet ﷺ prior to even his nubuwa, prior to his prophethood. And so we take that opportunity and we talk about him accepting Islam and coming to the city of Medina and then becoming Muslim and then eventually earning his freedom. But what I'll remind you is that Salman al-Farsi becomes Muslim shortly after the Prophet ﷺ arrives in the city of Medina. But he remains in slavery for the next almost four years. Three to four years. And he misses the battle of Badr and the battle of Uhud because he is a slave. He's not allowed to participate and go. At which time the Prophet ﷺ tells him to buy and purchase to earn his freedom. Salman al-Farsi radiallahu ta'ala anhu, with the help of the entire community, it's a very beautiful touching story, is able to earn his freedom. Mukataba, he's able to purchase and earn his freedom. And he becomes a free man. After which, 
He says, I never left the side of the Prophet ﷺ ever again. If he was in Medina, I was with him in Medina. When he left Medina, I traveled with him outside of Medina. I was with him every single moment, every single time. So Salman al-Farsi had been Muslim now for a few years, but he was very new to the community in the sense of that he had just recently become a free man. And so the Prophet ﷺ sat down for consultation. And he said, what should we do? Because going outside of Medina, everybody amongst the Sahaba said, that doesn't make any sense. But then how do we properly defend Medina against such a gigantic force? Right? That could just could, could sweep into Medina like a huge wave. So what do we do? So it is at that particular time and moment that Salman al-Farsi radiallahu ta'ala in spite of his newfound freedom, and still maybe feeling like he was still kind of working his way into the community, and, and the Sahaba maybe didn't know him all that personally and intimately because he was a slave who had not been able to fully participate in the community. In spite of all of that, and this is again a profound lesson about not just, we talk about the character of the Prophet ﷺ and his strategy and what he did, but this is a profound lesson in the culture and the community the Prophet ﷺ had established. And it is also a huge testament to the Sahaba the companions, radiallahu ta'ala anhum, about the types of, the type of community, the type of culture, the ethics and the morality that they had in their community. Where they did not build a community of exclusivity, they built a community of inclusivity. They were inclusive of people. It didn't matter if you became Muslim yesterday, it didn't matter if you were a slave, it didn't matter if you were an outsider, it didn't matter if you didn't even speak the language properly, it didn't matter what your status was, what your situation was, how new you were to the community, what else was going on with you. You said, La ilaha illallah Muhammadur Rasulullah, and you were a brother, you were a sister. And you had a place in that community, you had an equal voice in that community. Right? And that's something that again, very, I don't like to dwell on the negative. And there are many shining examples in our community of where that is not the case. But at the same time, we should deal in reality as well that unfortunately, that's something we lack to a great degree today. But that's, no, that's not to worry. It's not something that cannot be remedied or cannot be fixed. That is why we study the book of Allah. That is why we study the life of the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. So that we learn, we observe, we correct ourselves, and we bring that benefit to our communities, and thereby become a benefit to all of mankind and all of humanity. Alright, so Salman al-Farsi is a very new free man, and the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam is seeking consultation, and it's a very tragic, very difficult situation. What do we do? What do we do? And the Prophet, and Salman al-Farsi raises his hand and the Prophet ﷺ says, Yes, na'am ya Salman. Right? What, what do you have to offer, O Salman? And, the, and Salman al-Farsi radiallahu ta'ala anhu recommends the digging of a trench. Right? Medina on one side was fortified by the mountains. It was protected by the mountains where they could position archers strategically and then hold off anybody trying to advance through there because you can't just flow over a mountain completely. You'd have to come through the crevices and the mountain passes and that part of it you can then defend. All right, You can pick people off as they're trying to come through there. You bottleneck them. But the, re- the exposed side of the city of Medina, he said, we dig a trench all along. That is fairly deep, but more importantly, wide enough to the point where people can't just leap over. It's not just like a ditch, right? It's a trench. And it's huge. So that people can't just leap over. So for people to come through there, they would have to get down into the trench. And the second they get down in the trench, then again, what do you have? You have the vantage point. Right? You have the advantage. And then again, you can basically, you know, defend yourself from there. So it's a great strategy. And there are some narrations, Imam At-Tabari mentions this, Ibn Hisham mentions this, and um, Alama Suhaili in Rawdul Anf also mentions this, that this strategy of digging a trench was very new to the Arabs. And in fact, Imam At-Tabari also mentions that, أَوَلُ مَنْ حَفْرَ الْخَنَادِقْ مِنُو شِهْرْ إِبْنْ إِرَجْ Ibn Afridun wa kana fi zamani Musa alayhi salam that the first one to ever dig a trench and utilize a trench as a battle strategy and as a defense strategy was the name that I just read this individual and he was from the time of Musa alayhi salam right and so Salman al-Farsi who had seen the Persians or was familiar with the fact that this is a strategy the Persians use Right? He basically suggested this, Ashara bihi Salman, that is what Ibn Hisham, uh, rahimullahu ta'ala, in his seerah he mentions. And the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam accepted that suggestion. And in spite of being such a, you know, new or different, 
right? It was not a bad suggestion, but imagine you've never heard of this strategy before. Some of us would think it was bizarre. Like, what is this guy even talking about? Right? But that was not, again, not the culture of the Prophet ﷺ or the Sahaba. They, the Prophet ﷺ accepted the suggestion. And once the Prophet ﷺ approved of the suggestion, the Sahaba had their greatest quality, and that was سَمِعْنَا وَأَطَعْنَا We listened and we obeyed. Right? Once the Prophet ﷺ said it, it was done. Right? So they all fell in line, and they started digging the trench. And Ibn Ishaq mentioned something very beautiful, he says that not only did the Muslims start digging the trench, and Salman al-Farsi radiallahu ta'ala anhu also mentions in a narration that the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam had told them to divide up the area, right? Like ha- however many so, after having many so feet, like after every 15 feet or 20 feet or whatever it was, that there would be a group of people that would dig in like for 20 feet, and then there was another group of people and another group of people, they were digging in teams like this. And they had divvied up the, the area and they had kind of like a succession of people, you know, over a thousand Muslims, you know, spread out into these groups just digging the trench along. Alright? And the Prophet ﷺ himself, Ibn Ishaq says, فَعَمِلَ فِي رَسُولَ اللَّهِ تَرْغِيبًا لِلْمُسْلِمِينَ فِي الْأَجْرِ The Prophet ﷺ himself was digging the trench as well. Not only because the Prophet ﷺ didn't just tell, he was not the type of leader who told people to do work, he was the type of leader who did work and led by his own example. And then the Muslims were further even more motivated to dig. But of course, one little negative point I'll mention here, and then I'll move on to something a lot more positive. The munafiqun, the hypocrites, they of course were up to their old antics, right? If you remember um, that they didn't come participate in the Battle of Badr, they were constantly conspiring and conniving with the Jews who had tried to assassinate the Prophet ﷺ. They had come out for the Battle of Uhud and then tried to take 300 of their people and leave in hopes of trying to sabotage you know, the Prophet ﷺ and the army of the Muslims. They were always up to these antics. So they, they, they were still playing their old tricks and doing their, had the same old acts going on again. And a lot of them started to make excuses, oh I'm sick, or I'm injured, or I can't. And they, they, were, they were skipping out on the work. And not only that, but some of them also started to hide. So they wouldn't have to work and they wouldn't have to dig. And in Surah Tunur, towards the end of Surah Tunur, Ayah 62, through 64, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala speaks about them. إِنَّمَا الْمُؤْمِنُونَ الَّذِينَ آمَنُوا بِاللَّهِ وَرَسُولِهِ وَإِذَا كَانُوا مَعَهُ عَلَىٰ عَمْرٍ, عَلَىٰ أمر جَامِعٍ لَمْ يَذْهَبُوا حَتَّى يَسْتَأْذِنُوا That the believers are those people who believe. Subhanallah, it's remarkable. It might sound redundant in my simple, you know, faulty translation, but it's profound how Allah says it. That the people who truly believe are people who place their complete faith and trust in Allah and His Messenger Wasallam, And when they are with Him, in regards to a very important matter and issue, they will never leave the side of the Prophet Wasallam until they have permission. They will not move from the side of the Prophet Wasallam until they have permission. إِنَّ الَّذِينَ يَسْتَعْذِنُونَكَ أُولَٰئِكَ الَّذِينَ يُؤْمِنُونَ بِاللَّهِ وَرَسُولِهِ The people who even to go to the bathroom, they would take permission before leaving the task. They are the ones who truly believe in Allah and His Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Subhanallah, look at this part. And when people devoted themselves to the Messenger of Allah like that, and show, showed such, displayed such devotion and dedication and commitment and consistency, Allah vouched for them. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells the Prophet ﷺ that when they come and ask you for permission, maybe they have a need at home or they have to look after their family or they have to go check on a loved one. When they ask you for permission for something they need to do, then give them permission if you think it is appropriate and ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to forgive them. Like make dua for their forgiveness. So you give them permission and make dua for them. Allah vouches for them. In Allah ghafurur rahim. And then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, لَا تَجْعَلُوا دُعَاءَ الرَّسُولِ بَيْنَكُمْ كَدُعَاءِ بَعْضِكُمْ بَعْضًا Don't call on the messenger. Don't talk about the Prophet like you talk about each other. Because the munafiqun and being disrespectful would talk like, Ya Muhammad, Ya Muhammad. He said, no, no, you don't speak to the messenger that way. قَدْ يَعْلَمُ اللَّهُ الَّذِينَ يَتَسَلَّلُونَ مِنْكُمْ لِيْوَعْذًا 
And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said that Allah knows which one of you skips out on the work and sneaks around and hides around and like, like you know, uh, uh, is absent. You know like when a, when a kid at school is trying to hide from class and takes their sweet time wandering the halls, going to the restroom, trying to duck and hide from the teachers and the hall monitor. Right? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Allah sees you. And Allah knows exactly who you are. فَلْيَحْذَرِ الَّذِينَ يُخَالِفُونَ عَنْ أَمْرِهِ أَن تُصِيبَهُمْ فِتْنَةٌ أَوْ يُصِيبَهُمْ عَذَابٌ أَلِيمٌ That these people who directly disobey, they disobey a direct order of the Messenger wasallam. they should be very careful. Because either a huge calamity will come upon them, or some severe punishment from Allah might come upon them. Ala inna lillahi ma fi samawati wal ard. Because everything in the heavens and the earth belongs to Allah. Qad yalamu ma antum alayhi. Allah knows exactly what you're doing. Wa yuma yurjauna ilayhi fa yunabbiuhum bima amilu. And the day that you return back to Him, the day that these people go back to Allah, Allah will make them fully aware of everything that they did. Wallahu bi kulli shayin alim. Because Allah knows everything about everything. Allah knows everything about everything. Right? So you can't hide anything from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Now, to kind of end on a positive note, but I'll go ahead and start wrapping up here, um, maybe a little bit sooner than I had planned to conclude, but it's good. We'll, 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 uh, there's some very powerful, beautiful stories that I'd like for us to be able to talk about in a lot of detail. But I'll end on a positive note. To show you kind of the, the, the excitement and the energy, and the, the love, among, the energy and the excitement of the Sahaba, and the energy of the Prophet ﷺ, and how that energy and that excitement of the Prophet ﷺ was infectious, like it was, it was spreading to others, it would excite others, like good morale and good spirits, and how beneficial it was, and how much love, and, and um, you know, unity there was amongst the Prophet ﷺ and all the Sahaba as they were digging together. That one of the people who was digging, his name was Ju'ail. Ju'ail. He was one of the Muslims. His name was Ju'ail. Ju'ail is not a very good name because it almost means, the literal meaning of Ju'ail is like a small little thing. That's quite literally what it means. Like a small little thing. Bizarre, I don't know, maybe he was from the Bedouin tribes or whatever, but he had a name that the Prophet ﷺ didn't feel like it's a good dignified name. And so the Prophet ﷺ renamed him as Amr, which is a good dignified name, Amr. So they, as they were digging, and they, everybody was digging together the trench, there were certain like uh, chants that they were reciting together to kind of keep their energy and their spirits up. And one of the chants that they were reciting was, سَمَّاهُمْ مِنْ بَعْدِ جُعَيْلٍ عَمْرًا وَكَانَ لِلْبَائِسِ يَوْمًا ظَهْرًا That Muhammad is the one who named Ju'ayl Amr, and he is the one who gives us strength in the face of adversity. That he is the one who named Ju'ayl Amr, and he is the one who we draw, we, we, we draw strength from in the face of adversity. Like he, we find confidence in being with him. Not only that, and, and, and so this is the thing, حَتَّى إِذَا قَالُوا عَمْرًا قَالَ مَعَهُمْ رَسُولُ سَمْ عَمْرًا وَإِذَا قَالُوا ظَهْرًا قَالَ مَعَهُمْ ظَهْرًا That the Prophet ﷺ would read it with them. They would all say, سَمَّاهُمْ مِنْ بَعْدِ جُعَيْلٍ عَمْرًا And then the Prophet ﷺ would scream, عَمْرًا And then they would say the next part of it, وَكَانَ الْبَائِسِ يَوْمًا ظَهْرًا And then the Prophet ﷺ would say, ظَهْرًا Right? So then they kept digging together like this. And then they would say it again. And then the Prophet ﷺ again would say, Amra, Zahra, Amra, Zahra. Right? And then they were digging together like this. Not only that, but subhanAllah, they were all digging together, Muhajirun and the Ansar. And they didn't have enough food to eat. And many of them were becoming very weak and very frail. And the Prophet ﷺ noticed this and he saw this. And the Prophet ﷺ was so affected. And he felt such compassion, right, for his companions. That the Prophet ﷺ out loud said this dua, Allahumma inna al-aisha aishu al-akhira, faghfil lil-ansara wal-muhajira. That, oh Allah, <clears throat> the life that is worth working for is the life of the hereafter. So please forgive the Ansar and the Muhajirin. 
And when they heard the Prophet ﷺ say this, the Sahaba responded by saying, نَحْنُ الَّذِينَ بَايَعُوا مُحَمَّدًا عَلَى الْجِهَادِ مَا بَقِينَا أَبَدًا That we are the ones who have given the oath of allegiance to Muhammad. That we will stand and fight by his side as long as we are alive. And then the Prophet ﷺ kept making this dua for them and they kept responding with this. And every single time the Prophet ﷺ would say this dua, اللهم, and he had other versions of the dua as well, where the Prophet ﷺ said, اللهم إنه لا خير إلا خير الآخرة اللهم لا خير إلا خير الآخرة Oh Allah, there is nothing good, there is nothing better than the good of the life of the hereafter. And again, they would respond by saying, نَحْنُ الَّذِينَ بَايَعُودُ And then he said, فَبَارِكْ فِي الْأَنصَارِ وَالْمُهَاجِرَةِ That put barakah and blessing in the life of the muhajirin and the ansar. And again, they would respond by saying, نَحْنُ الَّذِينَ بَايَعُوا مُحَمَّدًا عَلَى الْجِهَادِ مَا بَقِينَا أَبَدًا And not only that, but when they would transfer the dirt, as they were digging the trench, they would transfer it on their own backs. And they would carry the rocks themselves. And it said that the Prophet ﷺ, he himself would also carry dirt and carry rocks to the point where his shawl opened up and he was carrying rocks. And the Sahaba say that his entire chest was covered with dirt. It was like, had become completely like, you know, dirty. And to the point where you couldn't see his skin, like it was completely covered with a layer of dirt. Everybody was digging in and everybody was working hard. And Abdullah bin Rawaha radiallahu ta'ala anhu, and I'll conclude and end with this, and then we'll talk about some very beautiful uh, stories, um, you know, from the story of Salman al-Farsi in terms of digging of the trench, and Jabir radiallahu ta'ala anhu preparing food for the Prophet sallallahu and the miracle that happened at that time. But I'll conclude with this. Abdullah bin Rawaha radiallahu ta'ala anhu also, he was a poet, and he was a warrior, he said some couplets of poetry. And the Prophet ﷺ liked it so much, he started also repeating it and saying the same thing. He said, Wallahi lawla Allahu mahtadayna, wala tasaddaqna wala sallayna, faanzilan sakinatan alayna, wa thabbitil aqdama in laqayna, inna al-ula qad baghaw alayna, idha aradu fitnatan abayna. That the Prophet ﷺ was also repeating this, that I swear to God, if it was not for Allah's mercy upon us, we wouldn't have been guided to the right path. We would have never known to give charity. We would have never, never known to pray. So Allah, please send down peace and tranquility upon us and establish our feet firm if we meet our enemies in the battlefield. These people, they want to fight us and attack us. And if they want to try to take our deen away from us, we will refuse. And the last phrase was abayna. So every single time they would say, إِذَا aradu fitnatan abayna, the Prophet ﷺ would yell loudly, abayna, 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 abayna. We refuse, we refuse. We will not let somebody take our deen away from us. And also um, the Prophet ﷺ, as Salman al-Farsi radiallahu ta'ala anhu says, at the, as the Prophet ﷺ was himself digging in the trench, Whenever we ran into a spot where we could not dig, we would call the Prophet ﷺ. And he would dig for us. And he says that I swear to Allah. He says, I swear to Allah. Abu Huraira radiallahu ta'ala also says, there was this huge rock that we just couldn't crack. And we called the Prophet ﷺ. We say, Ya Rasulullah, what do we do? The Prophet ﷺ took some of his saliva and dropped it onto the rock and said, Bismillah. And he says, I swear to Allah, as soon as his saliva touched a rock, it crumbled into dust. And the Prophet ﷺ, as he was digging, he was saying, Bismillahi wa bihi hudina. Walaw abadna ghayrahu shaqina. Ya habbada rabban wa habbadina. The Prophet ﷺ said, I, with the name of Allah, and by means of the name of Allah, we are guided. If we would have worshipped anyone other than Allah, we would have been lost. How amazing is our Rabb, and how amazing is our deen of Islam. And inshallah, we'll go ahead and pause here, and when we continue, we'll talk about some of the very beautiful incidents uh, that occurred while the digging of the trench at the Battle of Ahzab. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala give us all the ability to practice everything that was said and heard. Subhanallah bihamdihi, subhanakallah bihamdik, nashadu wa la ilaha illa anta, nasakfirka wa natubu ilayk.